Welcome to an introduction to virology and viral infections. The first part of this series deals with the nature of viruses, their size, shape, and composition. You can understand human viruses by thinking about computer viruses. Computer viruses, after all, are simply a series of command lines in a program. By themselves, they can do nothing that a computer can do. On the other hand, once it's copied into your computer, the virus can take control of certain functions, and what it does is it reproduces copies of itself in various places on your hard disk, and then it disseminates copies to other computers. So a virus is really just a set of instructions for self-replication, but it can also do a lot of harm to your computer. Human viruses are not that different than computer viruses and consist of a payload, which includes a set of instructions to require the cell to use its resources to make more viruses. But in this case, the payload is in the form of nucleic acids rather than in lines of computer code as you'd find in a computer virus. This payload is wrapped up in a protein coat with sometimes with other components that help the virus target itself to the appropriate cell. But basically, the concept is the same. A delivery system brings along a payload that takes over the functions of the cell. Many viruses are common in Ghana and should be well known to you by name. Here is a list of some of them, and I'll refer to them later in this uh, talk. Viruses have several distinct features that uh, distinguish them from other pathogens that you've heard about. They are all submicroscopic. None of them can be seen with a light microscope because of their size. Their shapes can be quite variable. However, there are some common themes that I will talk about in some detail in, in the next few slides. Viruses may be icosahedral, helical, or amorphous in shape when viewed in an electron microscope. Viruses only reproduce in living cells. And they don't replicate by dividing inside of living cells as bacteria do, but rather hijack the machinery of the cell to replicate themselves. They replicate their nucleic acids and their proteins, and then these factors assemble themselves into virions. Viruses do not divide. The next few slides will help you get an idea of the size of viruses. Now imagine that these large globes on this slide are Staph aureus bacteria. Pox viruses are among the largest known. If you lay four of them end to end, they would uh, reach the diameter of one Staph aureus bacteria. On the other hand, polioviruses are among the smallest viruses known. If you lay 10 of these end to end, they uh, would reach across the length of a pox virus. So you can see that in comparison to Staph aureus, a poliovirus indicated by the pink arrow uh, at the uh, central upper area of this slide would be very small indeed. And this virus would not even be visible as a speck of dust in a light microscope. As mentioned previously, viruses come in a variety of sizes and shapes. And this slide shows some of the variety that I'm talking about. In spite of this apparent variety, uh, many of the viruses that are depicted here are actually icosahedral in symmetry. That is, they're made up of 20 triangular surfaces uh, laid side by side with 12 vortices. Uh, note that the uh, nucleic acid is contained within this icosahedron. Also note that many of the viruses that are depicted in the images to the left are icosahedral, and the triangles are shown in blue. Other viruses are helical in nature and have a coiled nucleic acid in the center surrounded by a tube of proteins to protect them. These viruses tend to be spindle-shaped or filamentous in appearance. Whether they have icosahedral or helical symmetry of the nucleocapsid, many viruses also have an envelope that they acquire from one of the membranes inside of the cell that they infect. The envelope then becomes a, the surface that interacts with the next cell upon infection, and it usually has viral proteins deployed at that surface. The envelope is made of a lipid bilayer, and the virus can be deactivated with certain solvents 
if the envelope is damaged. So the components of a virus are summarized on this slide. First you have the genome, which is either made of RNA or DNA, and it is surrounded by one or more proteins that form the capsid. Together these two components make up the nucleocapsid, which will self-assemble inside the cell when the capsid proteins and the genome are synthesized. Some viruses have an envelope which is derived from a cell membrane and is composed of a lipid bilayer that may be studded with viral envelope glycoproteins. Those glycoproteins may be critical in interacting with the next cell that the virus infects. Much of what has been said about viral structure can be summarized in this slide. This is a slide that depicts the structure of Epstein-Barr virus with an electron micrograph on the left and a schematic diagram on the right. As you can see, like most herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr virus is surrounded by an envelope that is studded with surface glycoproteins. The glycoproteins are not immediately apparent in the electron micrograph because of their small size and poor resolution. Also poorly resolved is the nucleocapsid, which has an icosahedral symmetry, which would become apparent if the envelope were removed with the solvent.